global surprises in 30 minutes. Why there should be more exclamation marks in this unique book. Writer, church pastor and Bible teacher Mike Beaumont explains all to David Tavener. The topic of our conversation now is the strangest strategy. That sounds like it's something to do with military or military operations. I'm sure you'll explain more, Mike. Yeah, absolutely going to be to do with those things because we're going to be looking in this episode at some of the surprises that happened as Joshua has to lead the people to their first engagement of taking the promised land that God had given to them and as they overcome the city of Jericho. So just remind us of what's happened just up until this point. Well, remember, Israel have been in slavery in Egypt. God freed them, led them under the leadership of Moses, crossed the Red Sea, down to Sinai, where they received his law. Then there was a delay of 38 years because of their disobedience as they're left wandering around the desert. Moses dies. He's succeeded by Joshua, who then leads the people across the River Jordan. They'd moved up the eastern side of the Jordan, up that great King's Highway that ran from north to south there. And there had been that miraculous crossing of the River Jordan as God had held back the waters for his people to cross over. And as they'd gone over, they'd gone to Gilgal and there they'd renewed the covenant of the men had been circumcised who hadn't been circumcised during those wilderness years They'd celebrated the Passover. The manna that God had provided for the previous 40 years had stopped falling. And now it was time for them to possess their possessions. God had promised this land to their ancestors, to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, generations before. And now it was time for them to take hold of what God had promised to them. And standing in front of them, is this city of Jericho. Yeah, just a little obstacle here on the way. We've mentioned Jericho in previous episodes, a pretty impregnable fortress in those days. Archaeologists have discovered it's certainly one of the oldest fortified cities in the world. It's got huge walls, some of them four and a half feet thick. So this was a mighty fortress with a good water supply inside it. It was an oasis, so it meant it could hold out against attack. So it's got powerful walls. Uh, it's got its own water supply, and it's there dominating the road that ran from the King's Highway that ran on the east side of the River Jordan. And it linked that road to the road that ran up the coast of the Mediterranean on the west, the Way of the Sea, and ran between those two roads. So this was a really key fortress because it it sort of guarded that pass that ran through the middle of the country there. And so if Joshua could get a foothold here, if he could get down that pass, he could divide the country into two, and that's exactly what he will do and run his strategy from that, first taking the north, then taking the south. So a very, very strategic city, but frankly, an impossible city to take for any bunch of... Remember, this wasn't even an army. This, this was a bunch of people who've spent the last 40 years just surviving in the wilderness. So let's not think of them as a, a trained army like Egyptians might have had a trained army at this time. So these people are going to need an incredible strategy to be able to overcome this impregnable fortress. And Joshua is some sort of leader for them, some sort of military leader, I suppose you could say. He'll have strategies of his own. Yes, but he's first got to learn that actually the best strategy is not his strategies, but it's God's strategy. And he is reminded of that in this incredible encounter that happens at the end of Joshua chapter 5, after the whole incidence of the circumcision and celebrating Passover and so on at, at Gilgal. And we read at the end of chapter 5 that when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a, a drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went up to him and asked, are you for us or for our enemies? So he obviously thinks this is some sort of soldier. It's actually an angel. 
And the man replies, neither, he said, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell face to the ground in reverence and asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. So strategy number one will be to have an encounter with God. It's as if God is saying, Joshua, I want you to know you can't do this. You might have got all your plans, all your clever strategies, but you need to know, first of all, that that this strategy is mine. So when he sees this man, are you, are you for us or for them? Neither. I'm for God. I'm on God's side. Always a good thing to remember if we find ourselves in a time of division. God, are you for us or for them? Neither. I'm for God. And I'm for all of you lining up with him. And so here really is a call to Joshua to align his heart once again with the Lord and to do only what he says. And the way he responds of falling down onto the ground, recognizing this is holy ground. This is an encounter with the holy God moment. And that is the best strategy he could possibly have bowing before God and recognizing that anything that would happen now would be because of him and not just because of Joshua's clever thinking. The fact that he's the commander of the Lord's army, this angel, implies there's some kind of spiritual army then. It does, doesn't it? And in fact, we get glimpses into that throughout the Bible and we'll be looking at one of those in in a later episode in this series But it very much brings home there's a spiritual battle going on here as well. And of course, part of that lay in the fact that Jericho was not just a strong fortified city. The name Jericho sounds very much like the Hebrew word for moon. So there may well have been a whole bunch of moon worshippers in that city. So there's a, a spiritual conflict here as well. And as we'll see in this story, as God gives to Joshua his strange strategy, that it will involve a quite spiritual element for what happens to happen. So it's absolutely essential that Joshua takes God's lead and understands God's strategy. What is he actually up against in terms of Jericho then? Well, he's up against this incredible fortress that we've just said that really was quite impregnable. And chapter six begins with the words, now Jericho was tightly shut up because of the Israelites. So clearly they've seen and heard of this vast army of people coming to two and a half million, we've said is the estimate of the numbers. So what have they done? They've they've all withdrawn within the city walls. Remember, not everybody lived in cities in those days. Cities were often places you went to retreat in times of warfare. So people have retreated inside the city. It's tightly shut up. Its gates are barred and bolted. In other words, there is absolutely no way that anybody is going to get into this city as far as the Jericho inhabitants are concerned. But in contrast to that, the very next verse then says, then the Lord said to Joshua, see, I have delivered Jericho into your hands along with its king and its fighting men. So what a contrast those is, this probably strongest fortress in the known world at that time. It's now tightly shut up. It's got a good supply of water. And God says, I have delivered this city into your hands. Past tense, no, it's it's yours. You've just got to take it. How are they going to do that? We'll see in a moment. I was going to say, because that hasn't, of course, happened. But what Joshua and the others see with their eyes is this tightly shut up city. Do we sometimes face similar situations? Yeah, absolutely. Where what we see and what God says are two polar opposites. And that was the reality here. And this is where faith comes in. Which are we going to believe? Which are we going to let be the bigger vision that we see? Now, the problem ahead of them, a tightly shut up city, was a real problem, just like 
when things are facing us. They may be real problems, real situations, real challenges. God does not ask us to play act and pretend they are not there. Faith is about facing the reality of what is and yet at the same time holding on to what God says. And the two need to go together. We face reality. We acknowledge, yes, this is how things are, but God has said, God has promised. And that's something that we need to do when we face our challenges, not let the problem become bigger than God and what he has said. So does God reveal really, really clearly this strange strategy to Joshua? Absolutely. And frankly, from a human point of view, it's the craziest strategy you could have ever come up with. So I think it'd be good just to actually read what happens at this point. So having promised that he's delivered Jericho into his hands, God then says this, March round the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Make seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, make all the people give a loud shout then the wall of the city will collapse and the people will go up, every man straight in. So imagine, David, that you are Joshua. You've just heard God say that and you are now walking back to your leaders, your elders, your military commanders, and they're all saying, OK, what did God say? So what's the strategy? How are we going to take this place? Um, We are going to have a sort of praise march and we're going to march round it just once a day in silence apart from the priest blowing the ram's horn and then on the seventh day we're going to march round it seven times and and then all of us are going to shout and the walls will fall down and you'll walk in and take the city now don't know about you, but I would have felt somewhat awkward and embarrassed. Bit let down, really. Yeah, because, you know, you, you've become well-known and well-respected as the leader that Moses has trained up. You know, you've been involved in a whole number of battles on the way to get here. And now here is this crazy strategy, this strangest of strategies that... It's all going to happen by marching round the city and shouting. <sighs> this will be a real test of faith for Joshua, even to communicate this to people, let alone to carry it out, wouldn't it? Because it doesn't sound as if it's even psychological warfare, because just walking round that fortified city and blowing some trumpets, I can't imagine, really, that that's going to frighten the living daylights out of... <laughs> no, it probably wouldn't. I, I, I imagine it would have been a bit unnerving because, you you know, you would be sitting there thinking, what are they what are they up to? But, of course, the whole point of this is, is, is not the psychological warfare or the unnervingness of it. It's going to be about the miracle that God will do. God has clearly said through that command, this battle's not yours. This is all about... God and so the whole story of Jericho is is about Israel learning to do things God's way. If God's people are going to come into God's promises, then it will have to be done God's way and not another way. So it's one thing for them to be told this is how it's got to be done. Did they do that? Yes, they did. The chapter goes on to tell us exactly what happened? So Joshua got up early the next morning. The priest took up the Ark of the Lord. The seven priests carrying the seven trumpets went forward, marching before the Ark of the Lord and blowing the trumpets. And of course, trumpets, we're thinking of the ram's horn type trumpets here with their strange wailing sound. The armed men went ahead of them and the rear guard followed the Ark of the Lord while the trumpets kept sounding. And so on the second day, they marched around the city once. 
and returned to the camp. So each day, I happen to read there, I think, from the second day rather than the first, but each day they keep doing this until on the seventh day they got up at daybreak and marched around the city seven times in the same manner, except that on the seventh day they circled the city seven times. And the seventh time round, when the priest sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the people, shout, for the Lord has given you the city. Now, I wonder what they shouted, by the way. You know, if you were part of it, David, I wonder, you know, what would you shout? Would you shout, for the Lord, or for Joshua, or we win, or I wonder what they would have shouted. Would they have shouted some praise to God? And uh, that's exactly what they do. They do this, and as they do it, what God said happened. The walls collapse, they are able to go in, and they're able to take the city. It's a very detailed strategy, and I guess there's significance in the number of times they go round and this seventh day. Yes, in Jewish thinking, numbers were often used symbolically, and the number seven was the number that Jews associated with God and his work. Why? Well, because, of course, going back to creation story, it was on the seventh day that God rested from his labors and made it holy. And so the number seven became associated in Jewish thinking always with God and God being at work. So while for the first six days they simply march around once, it's on the seventh day, God's day, that they march around seven times, God's declared number. It's as if God is underlining, this is God, this is God, this is God. Just remember, guys, this is not you. This is not your clever strategy. This is not your warfare. This is me doing this. And so that number seven gets highlighted and it's only on the seventh time round on the seventh day that they make this shout and the walls collapse. So we've called this conversation the strangest strategy because it's certainly that. I mean, the volume, of course, of however many people it was shouting would have been quite significant and, as you said earlier, unnerving. Yeah, sure would. But that's not the point. It's, it's, it's not what the people did, it's what God did. Yes, absolutely. You know, and, and how this happened, well, people have wondered, you know, even things like, was it the shouting and the frequency and the wavelength that caused the walls to collapse? Others have thought, was it an earthquake? Because that part of the world we know is particularly prone to earthquakes. And we've already seen how God uses natural phenomena but overrules the timing with things like the rockfall that blocked the water so that they could cross over the River Jordan. So it could well have been an earthquake that brought down the walls at that moment. And God superintended it so that it was, I mean, just imagine the timing of that. So it was just at that moment as they shouted out, and that's when the earthquake struck, if that's what it was. But the story itself really isn't interested in the mechanics of how it happened, what it's interested in is the fact that it's when they did what God said that it happened. So if I just read the verses of what happened there, when the trumpet sounded, the people shouted, and at the sound of the trumpet, when the people gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. So every man charged straight in and they took the city. So the emphasis there is very much on at the moment they did exactly what God had commanded. That was the moment that these walls came down. And, you know, this is a whole series about Bible surprises. I think the surprise, well, actually, the surprise both ways. The surprise for the Israelites when it collapsed, because, okay, they'd heard what the strategy was but it's one thing it's one thing to be told the promise of what god's doing it's another to actually see it and i'm sure there must have been an incredibly pleasant surprise wow it really did happen did it and 
On the other hand, the very different kind of surprise for the citizens of Jericho, who had felt so confident, so self-assured, so secure in what? In the works of their hands, their hands and their ancestors' hands who had built these strong walls, four and a half feet thick. Nobody has got in there. The city is tightly shut up. We, we can survive being sieged for years. We've got water supply in here. We've got food in here. This is an oasis. What a surprise it must have been to them when the walls collapsed. Now, perhaps they were expecting eventually some sort of siege and them attacking and doing something to try and get the walls down. But the shock of the walls coming down and discovering that your God hadn't protected you must have been enormous, I think, for them. It was obviously very important for Joshua and the people for Jericho to have been conquered. How important was it for God? It was very important for God in that he asked them to do something very special. He asked them to do something with Jericho that he will never ask them to do for the whole of the rest of the taking of the promised land. The city was to be entirely devoted to the Lord. Now, obviously, one of the things that commonly happened in the ancient world when a city was taken was that, that booty was taken. You know, you took plunder. You think, oh, yeah, that's a good gold cup. I'll have that. That was, I mean, part of the way that soldiers got their wages in the ancient world. But God had said very clearly before this happened, you're not to do that with this city. You are to devote everything to me. Actually, this is the one occasion in the whole of this story of the taking of the promised land when God says that every living thing is to be killed. Now, I know we find that very tough in our sort of sensitive Western world these days, don't we? But do remember, these people had, had had plenty of chance to repent, plenty of chance to turn away from their sin to the living God. At least one lady and her family had already done so, Rahab and her family that we looked at in a previous episode. They'd heard about God's people marching. Rahab had said, we've heard what God has done for you. So this is not out of the blue, and yet they had chosen to firmly resist what God had said he would do for hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, it had been promised. And God had even said to Abraham when he promised to give him this land, I can't give you this land yet until, the verse says, until the sin of the Amorites is filled up, is completed. Amorites, they're used as a general word for the various ites in the land. And it's as if God is saying, all those years back, Abraham, I intend to give you this land, but I can't give it you yet because the inhabitants aren't sinful enough so that anybody with half a brain can see it was right that they had become so sinful that they couldn't continue any longer. And it's now when that point has come that God allows the descendants of Abraham to take this city, but nothing is to be kept for them. Everything is to be devoted to the Lord. It's to either be taken and put in his treasury or simply destroyed. In fact, we read in verse 24 that they burnt the whole city and everything in it, but they put the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron into the treasury of the Lord's house. Only Rahab and her family are spared, as we looked at in the previous episode. So God did see this as very different. It, it was a way of saying, again, I want you to understand this is about me. This is about me leading you. This is about me establishing my people for my purposes in my place. This is not about you. It's not about what you get out of it. So Jericho becomes a, a very, very special place. Nothing is to be taken. Sadly, there would be one guy who thought he knew better than God. 
we'll get the story in the next chapter, chapter seven, the story of Achan, who did take some of the booty from the city. And so when they went on to try and attack the next city of Ai, they were terribly defeated. And when they went to God and said, why was that? And God said to them, well, it's because there's sin in the camp. Someone took booty from the city that I said they were not to, the city that was mine and mine alone. And sadly, he and his whole family, who were probably implicit in it because he hid what he took in the ground under his tent. So if ever you try to dig up soil and cover it so it can't be seen again, you'll know it's pretty impossible. So God did see this as something very special, as a way of marking out that this whole process of taking the land was about him and his plan and him being at the centre. And the way that Jericho was taken and dedicated to him was designed as a permanent reminder of that. It sounds like it was also important for God to see this fortress city fallen because of what had been happening within that city. And I just wonder whether there's any parallel with, with our own lives. We can we can sometimes treat life in a, in a sort of fortified way. Yeah, do you know what? I think there's a powerful picture here for us today. It's very easy, even for those of us who are Christians, to have little Jerichos in our life, little fortresses, little areas where we have not let God in where they are private and maybe some sin or action or some love a passion in our life that, that we keep for us and it has grown and the walls have become strong and, and the, that little city inside us has become tightly shut up. And for me, this chapter speaks at a wider level of how God does want to break down those fortresses in our lives. They might be fortresses in our thinking, old patterns of thinking that we have got into, old habits that we have never really shaken free of, the language that we use, the thoughts that we have, the things we do or don't do can be like Jerichos, can be like fortresses, but God can break them down. And you know, I would say today to any of our listeners who are sort of feeling something in their heart stirring, I recognize there's a Jericho in my mind, in my heart, a, a fortress that's strongly shut up there against God. If you will open your heart to God and ask for prayer for that, God can break that Jericho down and can destroy it. These Jerichos can be overcome. It doesn't matter how strong the fortress in our mind or our heart or our life or our body or our family or our thinking, God can break it down if we will bring it to him. And just in conclusion, I mean, the walls come tumbling down. This city of Jericho is a pile of rubble. Do the people of Israel just move on and leave this behind them? Well, they do because this, remember, was the gateway to the whole of the promised land. And what they are going to do now is, is push to the west and take the next city of Ai. And then, as I mentioned, they will push north and they will push south over the coming years. They're going to have to fight for this. I suppose, in a sense, that in itself may have been a surprise for Israel because God had promised this land. You know, But, but sometimes we, we have to do our part in taking hold of the promises that God God has made for us. So all those promises of God, they're, they're going to be confronted by reality, these various fortress cities that, that exist in the land. One interesting thing is as they move on, uh, there's a little passage at the end of chapter six where it says, at that time, Joshua pronounced this solemn oath, cursed before the Lord is the man who undertakes to rebuild this city, Jericho. At the cost of his firstborn son, will he lay its foundations? At the cost of his youngest, will he set up his gates? And that's exactly what would happen in life. It would never be rebuilt. But there was a guy in the time of King Ahab who tried to rebuild it. And he did so, the story Stadley tells us, at the cost of the life of two of his children, who died in the process. And so that curse that was put on the city on that day proved to be true. 
So this strangest strategy that we've been talking about was God's strategy all along. Yeah, absolutely. And (laughs) I suppose the one big takeaway from this is if we're walking closely with the Lord, then, you know, things may look like they're unbeatable in front of us. But if we will listen to God and follow his strategy, and so much of that strategy for life is is in this book, the Bible, that we are working our way through. Sometimes God makes his strategy clear through the wisdom of other Christians around us or, or through a prophetic word. But if we will listen to what God says and follow his strategy, then strange as it may seem, there is no fortress that can't come down. You've been listening to Mike Beaumont in conversation with David Tavner. Bible Surprises in 30 Minutes is a United Christian Broadcasters production. For more about UCB, go to ucb.co.uk.